All right. All right. Hey guys, welcome back to We Talk Money. I'm your host, Chris Dunn. I'm here with Nikki, a certified financial planner, and Travis, former hedge fund investor, now turned to the light side. Um, before we jump in, just want to thank Y Charts for sponsoring the show and thanking all of you guys who have been supporting us for the past year or two that we've been doing this. And uh, let's just go ahead and jump into it. How are you guys doing? Great. Good. Good. No complaints. Yeah, well, the, well, the, the yeah, I know the stock market's kind of doing a little pullback this week. We've got a ton of earnings and macro news. Uh, also, some exciting stuff happening in crypto. So what do you guys want to jump into first? Do we start with the markets in turmoil or the Robin Hood? <laughs> Let's start with <laughs> Robin Hood. <laughs> we can tie in the crypto angle. We can tie in earnings. It, it's kind of a, a, a bellwether for market sentiment as well. Let's just pull up the chart and you guys can talk about what happened. Yeah, it looks like they reported earnings after hours today. Uh, interestingly enough, the market didn't love the forward guidance. You know, apparently Robinhood timed this IPO perfectly. You know, they uh, they brought the stock to market right as the business was hitting like peak growth, and now they're saying in the third quarter they expect less accounts and less growth. Uh, they'll still grow year over year, but uh, but at a lower rate. And so that was a little bit disappointing to the market. Uh, some interesting tidbits in their earnings release this week. So. Most about 80% of their total revenue comes from either options or crypto. And about 60% of all of their new accounts in the most recent quarter made their first trade in crypto. So you could make the case here that Robinhood is becoming less and less of a stock focused company and more of a crypto focused company, which I think is a, an interesting tidbit from their earnings release. So, super so a coin, interesting. Coin yeah, the Coindesk article here says that uh, over 40% uh, of their, what is this, revenue was from crypto up from 17% in the first quarter. That's a pretty big jump. Yep. Oh, and uh, I like that little bullet point down there that 62% uh, of the crypto revenues were Dogecoin. <laughs> yeah. Look, that I, I think this just goes to show you like who is on Robinhood, right? Like it is the ultimate kind of retail trader, right? It's the person who's buying Robinhood because they heard Elon talk about it. It's the person buying GME and AMC, you know, the meme stocks, right? Like, so if you want to track what the the retail trader is doing, I, I think Robinhood's the place to look. Yeah, great point. Great point. Yeah, I love that Robinhood likes to talk about, you know, democratizing investing, but really they're just a platform for degenerates. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is a gambling platform at this point. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, I think the data is pretty clear on, you know, day traders losing money. And now, I mean, look, I'll just pull up the Dogecoin chart and, you know, we can talk about this. And it was kind of... I don't know. It, it kind of frustrated me over the past week to see Mark Cuban and Elon both doubling down on their uh, their Doge narrative. And look, I, I don't have anything against Doge, but and we don't have to get technical in this show, but it's it's very clear that it doesn't hold a candle to Bitcoin. And when you have somebody like Mark Cuban that says that Doge is a better store of value than Bitcoin, it, it or medium of exchange, it just it, it really frustrates me. And it the reason why is because people lose money, right? Like when Elon was pumping it earlier in the year, look, I mean, Doge had a over 75 or 80% uh, pullback here in price. And so all the people that were buying near the top, think about that. They're down, you know, 70, 75, 80%. And I just, I really hate to see the little guy get slaughtered like that. And especially when they're led to slaughter by these guys that are supposed to know what they're talking about, but I don't know. It's it's just frustrating to me. It is. It's it's also frustrating because there's so much innovation happening in crypto right now, and the we we talk about you know different types of innovation on this show. Probably once a month, we talk about a different corner of crypto that's building something interesting, right? And Dogecoin seems to be like one of the least interesting <laughs> yeah. and the least innovative projects that's basically abandoned by its original creators. So. Um, yeah, I think, you know, sure, if you want to believe that it's a, a, you know, a fun meme token or whatever and have fun with it, that's fine. Just, you know, let's let's be real and honest about what this is like Cuban and, and Elon need to, you know, back away. And and like you said, like the, the comments and the doubling down on it from these guys who are supposed to be figureheads in society is disappointing to me. Why? Yeah. Why, why are they doing it? I mean, why are they pumping Dogecoin? I think it's 
I don't know, like there, there was a really good Reddit post about why Elon was doing what he was doing when he started trashing Bitcoin and then went all in on, uh, on Doge. And it, it really boiled down to ego and him like, and again, this is all like, you know, speculation, but it, you know, it's, it's about him not being a founder in crypto, right. And trying to jump on the bandwagon and we, we don't have to speculate. All I want to say is speaking to the investors and traders out there, just don't buy the bullshit. <laughs> like when, when you hear anyone from billionaire status on down to a plebe that's talking about what they think the markets are going to do, make your own decisions, right? Like do your own research and educate yourself. If you find yourself blindly following anybody into any project because they have either an, you know, a founder that sounds really charismatic, right? And creates a cult following or a billionaire who says, oh, I'm going to put a bunch of money into something or even people like us who have been in the game for a long time and we have our opinions, but we always say like, don't ever blindly follow us into anything. We want people to really understand what they're getting into and why, right? That's, that's how you can really have conviction to hold positions when prices crashing or when you hear something negative in the news, right? If you're educated about it, you're going to be able to make better informed decisions and have those diamond hands when they really matter, right? Yeah. Famous last words until Doge 10X is from here, some <laughs> shit like that, right? <laughs> you know, I, I hope it does. And if it has a great trade setup, I'll trade it. And people always ask like, Chris, what, what projects do you think are going to win several years from now? I don't know. I'm a, I'm more of a midterm kind of trader, right? Like I trade market cycles and you can see the behavior of the market participants in the price action. So I think, you know, when it comes to looking at crypto and trying to decide which projects are going to win, just trade the damn chart, right? Just let the trend and, and let the price action in the market cycles on the chart be a guide and get rid of all the other noise. Well said. So, all right, cool. Let's go ahead and jump into the stock market. I know there's quite a bit happening. We're in earnings season. We've got a bunch of macro stuff popping off, a lot of news. Um, what do you guys want to tackle first? We should probably tackle the correction that's going on in the S&P. Yeah. So, it's funny when you, when you look at, you know, like a couple of years worth of price history, uh, this little pullback is basically... So, no, nothing. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's a blip on the chart right now. Th in hindsight, this could turn out to be the all time market high for several years. You don't know until after the fact, but it feels like people are kind of freaking out this week, right, Nick? Yeah, yeah. It's 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 definitely um, interesting to watch because we really haven't seen a very significant correction, even with everything feeling red and down. Um, I. I I was actually, you know, looking at the channel, like from a technical analysis perspective, the S&P 500 has been trending in this very, very strong upward channel for ever since March of 2020, when the big sell-off happened. And since then, we have not seen a deeper than about a 23% correction um, as the market has chugged its way up. Um, so really, if that trend line of support ends up breaking down from a technical perspective, we could really see the market let go quite significantly. So if people are feeling nervous right now, you know, just something to keep in mind is we have been in the golden age over the past year, you know, or so for, for these markets. This is this has been the most easygoing bull market that you know an investor could ever ask for hasn't been a lot of volatility uh the range has been very small um that the 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 trading range that is so look this could get this could get worse and i would say people should be preparing for a deeper correction that doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's a bad thing i think when the market's up you know and it doubles you know the market's doubled since the march of 2020 sell off and there was, you know, some there was an article that came out in Bloomberg, a pretty nice uh, chart that showed that whenever the market doubles, there's usually a pretty significant correction that follows when that happens. So I think that people should just start preparing that the gloom or the uh, the rosy days, you know, might be 
slowing down and coming to an end, we might start to actually see the market um, give in a little. And I, I think overall, that's going to be good. That's going to give us lots of opportunities. Um, valuations are still up there, uh, not only in the broad market, but in you know many individual names and many individual stocks. So I think that that's a welcomed opportunity. At least I think Travis and I kind of see that as a welcomed opportunity. As long as, as nothing is getting too sketchy in the overall economy to where we need to be truly, really concerned about, you know, the economic recovery, um, then I think that, you know, prepare for it and seize, seize the moment when it comes. Yeah. So, the chart is pretty interesting seeing how it, I guess, after the tech bubble, it's the price action has doubled five times and each time it's had a, a pretty deep correction after that. Right. Yeah. Yes. Trevor, you were going to say something? Yeah. So to your point, Nikki, about, you know, the economic environment. So we have seen some economic indicators, forward economic indicators that have started to turn down. We've also seen the rate of change in inflation in both the U.S. and the U.K. as of the last uh, couple of weeks, readings that we've gotten slow down. So uh, it is possible that it, it's, you know, Delta driven, COVID driven. Uh, we've also seen some of the travel data, uh, tr data from like the you know U.S. travel numbers from the TSA and things like that show a, a little bit of a slowdown there. That was a very hot sector throughout the summer, so we've seen some travel activity slow down. So, uh, housing starts missed estimates. Um, China retail sales were pretty weak. U.S. retail sales came in a little under expectations. So, mm -hmm. these are some data points suggesting that. There is a little bit of a weakening uh, here. I don't know if it's going to be short-lived because of Delta, and then we're going to push right on through at the end of the year, but uh, it's worth noting, and I think that's why we've seen some weakness. Also worth noting that when you look at the Russell, uh, Nikki, you pointed this out uh, as well earlier, that uh, small caps are down actually a more significant percentage over the past couple of weeks, down, I believe, what, 8 to 10% or so, uh, depending on which small cap index you're looking at. And so... Uh, a lot of the small cap stocks actually within the index that you can find a number of them that are down 30, 40, 50% in the past couple of months. So uh, there's been some pretty significant corrections under the surface. You know, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, 25 to 30% of the value is made up by like, what, six, seven stocks. So um, I think it's useful to also look a little deeper and, and um, we're getting a bit more of a correction than it might even seem from looking at, you know, the broadest indices. Yeah. And, and looking at the Russell 2000 right now, I mean, it's basically been flat since February um, yeah. and it's kind of rolling over right now. It's testing the 200 uh, period moving average. And so there's a lot of open air below that. Um, so, yeah, I, I think to your point, Trav, if, you know, some of these uh, stocks continue to pull down the overall indices, like things could get shaky pretty quick. Yeah, Chris, there was a Y chart, uh, chart, I just popped it in chat for you, that was showing the actual percent off of the highs comparing the Russell, the NASDAQ, and the um, S&P. And, you know, you can kind of see that that divergence there and, and how deeply the small caps are are correcting compared to, you know, the large caps. So, um, yeah, yeah, interesting to see, like, if we look back three years you can see at the depths of the March 2020 panic, the Russell 2000 was down over 40% where the S&P and the NASDAQ were down about 30%. Um, and it's it, what's also interesting in this chart is to see that, you know, since then, since the recovery after making new all-time highs, you know, the pullbacks have been relatively muted, you know, about like 7 to 10% on average so far That's at least. That's a really good point. And, and actually, I wanted to point this out earlier, um, the fact that, you know, investors have been kind of spoiled, you know, over the recent year, year and a half with these um, much more shallow corrections. Yeah. And, you know, if you look back historically, you'll see that that we are, it's more common to see, you know, deeper corrections. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, like Travis pointed out, the economic data is starting to show some signs of weakening. Delta is definitely spooking people. Uh, people might not go out as much. And um, that's something to, to keep an eye on. 
Yeah, it's yeah. interesting what happens when you pump all this money into the stock market, you know, and you see things just get super overvalued. And obviously, we've been talking about the supply chain issues for over a year. And it just seems well, like this, this kind of doldrum is just dragging on. And it's just weird to see the market hit new all-time highs while the economy is showing a lot of signs of weakness. I don't know. What do you make of that, well, Chuck? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I was so, going to. By the way, guys, we're not in the studio today. So there's Ugh. like a delay on our mics. So we're so probably going to talk over each other a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's so annoying. Sorry, guys. I just I wanted to point out that another part of I think this S&P or broad market weakness is the talks of the Fed tapering asset purchases. And they are wanting that to be seen as a separate event to them raising interest rates. They've made that pretty clear. But that's I think that's spooking the market as well. Yeah, it's it's going to be weird if just as the market and the economic data is weakening, the Fed actually starts to tighten. <laughs> uh, but we've seen that before. We saw that in the fall of 2018 when the Fed was um, being too aggressive with raising rates. And we had got a 20% market correction over a two to three month period. I actually wouldn't mind seeing that. I think that would provide a lot of really great buying opportunities for us who have dry powder and hedges on. So, you know, that that could be a possibility. I'd be surprised if we get anything quite that deep because um, I don't think the Fed is going to get too aggressive, but they are going to taper those asset, asset purchases. They're already signaling that. That's probably going to start in early fall. Now, that's probably the right decision. We've talked about that on the show in the last couple of weeks. Why is the Fed still buying bonds? Why is the Fed still you know, supporting the mortgage bond market, for instance, when we're in one of the strongest housing markets ever, right? So they needed to do that back in the spring, but uh, they're going to do that probably right as some stuff is weakening. And it's, it's not a great look for the market. That could also be why we're seeing some sell-off. Uh, we're also seeing commodities sell off a bit too. Crude's been down and pretty weak. Even lumber has come all the way back down. So uh, yeah, it'll be an interesting next couple of months because the fall also historically has been a fairly volatile time period in some years. So I'm excited actually. We'll see. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be a lot of opportunity and, and talking about volatility. I mean, dude, it's so crazy seeing lumber, you know, we were watching the breakout above like seven, 800, and then it quickly doubled almost to 1900 or 1800. And then on the year, believe this, <laughs> lumber is down over 30% from the start of the year, right back into its range. And, you know, again, this isn't uncommon with commodities, right? When you have something that, you know, when the price of it goes up, well, producers of that commodity increase production, increase supply, which inherently brings the, the price back down. So, uh, it's interesting to see that. Also, oil is starting to pull back a little bit, copper, some of the other metals, um, I don't know. Is there anything else in the, the commodities market that's kind of a signal or a bellwether? I mean, copper, you mentioned it, is always one to watch for, um, you know, the, its industrial applications and its readout for the broader economy. Some some watchers call it Dr. Copper <laughs> <laughs> because it's, uh, it's often an interesting signal, forward-looking signal sometimes for uh, the manufacturing side of the economy. So uh, very interesting to see that. But yeah, I mean, it's already weakening. And I think there's a case here that we see, uh, at least for a quarter or two, um, a lot of similar readings from other commodities and other assets. So yeah, buckle up. I mean, I think it could be a pretty interesting next couple of months in stocks. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I think, you know, crypto is also on kind of the same pace where, you know, Bitcoin's been kind of mid-range for a few months now and it's starting to coil up and we're really starting to see that momentum build. And so- I think we've got a volatile quarter ahead of us. Agreed. Awesome. All right. So we talked about that. What are, okay. So I know right now during earnings season and there's some stuff happening with SPACs, what specific tickers do you guys want to talk about? Where's the opportunity? What do you think our listeners should know that they could get the most value out of? Well, First of all, we should mention it is earnings season still, Q2 earnings season, and it's been interesting to watch. This has been a brutal earnings season for any companies that even met or, God forbid, missed their guidance, especially SPACs. I mean, SPACs are in an extremely um, gloomy moment in time for that, for that whole uh, sector of the market. Uh, we've seen some SPACs down 40, 50, 60% in a trading day or two if they missed their guidance. Now, 
I must say, like you could bring up a couple of charts like ATIP or KPLT. Look, if you're bringing a company to market via SPAC and you put out these rosy projections for five years out uh, that suggest this massive growth that will justify this massive valuation, then you damn well better at least hit your first few quarters of growth expectations and revenue and projections, right? So some of these SPACs have actually right off the bat within a month or two of giving guidance and going public, they actually miss that guidance. It's like, wow. you know, uh, it's, it's, it's almost like a pump and dump in a way. I'm sure it's like some the of new penny stocks. Yeah. The yeah. App. So there's, there's quite a few app, app harvest, another one. So uh, quite a few here that have missed guidance right off the bat in their first quarter. You should never do that as a public company. You got to give conservative guidance now, we have seen some SPACs also beating guidance and raising guidance. We saw that from uh, Hims and Hers, the uh, direct-to-consumer health company. That stock's actually still down. Uh, we saw, I think, Mudrick Capital today, which is taking tops public. They raise their guidance. Um, we've seen a couple of couple of these companies actually raise guidance, which is good to see. But, um, but the SPAC market is in, in a really tough place, and they're basically, you know, they've got a lot to prove. So if you're holding SPACs, I mean you've got to really believe that they can deliver or that you're willing to hold through some significant volatility periods there. Um, but it's also true of a lot of companies in the market right now. If you're not blowing out your guidance uh, right now in terms of your quarterly earnings, your stock is probably getting whacked. It's a tough and environment. I, I think you guys warned of this like six months ago where it was like, look, things are so hot, right? Like meme stocks are going to the moon. Everybody's chasing all this shit. And it, it was like, what? Well, at some point in the future, the rooster is going to come home to roost, whatever that <laughs> analogy is. It's like you're you're going to have to show what you can do, right, and live up to the hype. And the ones that aren't are probably getting whacked the hardest. Yeah, I think that, you know, this is part of the reason that the SEC, you know, wants more regulation on the SPAC front because they put out these rosy projections and these investors kind of get bamboozled. If, if they're just blowing smoke up their butts. So yeah, it's definitely interesting to kind of watch it all unfold. Yeah. There will continue to be a lot of alpha opportunities and SPACs, both on the long and short side, I think going forward, but we will see, I think this is my prediction. We'll see the SPAC market will demand or investors will demand that the SPACs become higher quality, lower valuations. The sponsors are going to have to take more risk when it comes to um, locking up their shares and having performance-based hurdles. So that's all great because I think what we saw in the spring was just a, a free-for-all money grab. And now um, we're seeing the fallout. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm actually interested to see if the SPAC market just kind of dies off in the next six months or if we'll still see new SPACs with better terms. Mm -hmm. um, but irregardless, you know, we have a lot of new companies coming public via these SPACs. And so there's going to be a lot of washouts and a lot of opportunities for like uh, comeback stories. And then, um, you know, certainly opportunities for to short some of these probably to, to zero, but, um, but yeah, that, that's, that's been an interesting corner of the market to watch. And uh, we've got some interesting kind of asymmetric plays in the SPAC uh, market that haven't quite played out yet, but I, I'm excited for those. So well, stay tuned on that. Nice. Yeah. Talking about, you know, kind of in the same category of just overhyped stuff, uh, Coinbase was, uh, they just put out an article today talking about how they're stockpiling over $4 billion in cash in case of a crypto winner. So they're even kind of locking down and, and starting to like de-risk. And, you know, we've seen uh, a little bit of fee compression in the space, but the, obviously with Robinhood and some of the other companies that are really stepping in and going after crypto hard, like, you know, some of the, like, if we look at Coinbase's stock, you can see, I mean, it's really just, it had a little bit of a pop over the past couple of weeks, but then it's just been fading off again. So yeah, it seems like everything that got overhyped in the first half of the year is now just really starting to, to pull back. So if you have strong conviction on something, that means better prices. If you chased and bought the high, you're probably sweating a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Valuations matter after all. <laughs> Speaking of companies stockpiling assets for rainy day, uh, Palantir, that was an interesting headline this week about Palantir uh, taking 50 million of its cash hoard and investing it in gold bars, uh, <laughs> which I thought was interesting and got some, some interesting headlines from. 
Yeah. Um, now they have over two billion of cash on the balance sheet, so fifty million. It, it's not immaterial, but it's also you know it's not like the vast majority of their cash holdings. But uh, pretty pretty odd choice. You don't really see very many companies using their their cash holdings to invest in physical gold uh, in a vault. So uh, I thought that was interesting. I'm shocked they didn't go the crypto route. And they have talked about that actually on their on their last quarterly call. They were asked specifically about putting Bitcoin in the balance sheet, and they said that they've talked about it and they're considering it. So uh, that could also happen at some point. But um, I know some people were asking me about what I thought about Palantir's investing in gold bars in case of black swans, because you know Palantir is an, uh, like an analytics firm that gets a lot of sensitive government data. And so the thinking was, well, um, do they know something that we don't, that the rest of us don't? And uh, yes. when I when I read through the, the comments from the the, the the, you know, the gold purchases that they talk about in their quarterly filing it seemed to me like it was more not um, not due to like an imminent event that they're expecting, but just because they expect more, I think, political volatility in the world, um, which we already actually are seeing this week. So I think, you know, who knows? Yeah, go- gold's an interesting choice for them because, you know, I mean, not that we want to take a snapshot on any particular day of performance and then say that justifies future investment. But, you know, gold is down still five, you know, like 5% on the year where Bitcoin's up 50%. So I, I wonder what the thought process is there. Like, like you said, they either know something that the mass majority of people don't, or maybe they're making plays behind the scenes that we don't know about that they just don't want to say quite yet. I don't know that I, I would lean that direction. Yeah. You think, uh, you think they know something we don't? Well, yeah. I mean, I don't know, <laughs> but how can I, they I not? Know. I, yeah. I mean, of course they do, but would they m- use that information to, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I really don't care what they do. I've stopped caring what any public company and what any billionaire or any single cult leader does. I just follow my own investment thesis and, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Yeah, that's I don't know, fair. Maybe they're going for a diversified strategy. They're going to do a little gold, a little, little bit of bonds, a little bit of Bitcoin eventually. I don't yeah. know. You know, maybe maybe we're reading into it too much. Maybe everybody's reading into it too much, too. Yeah, that exactly. that's why I stopped caring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was my take, too. I don't think it, it's it's anything to overreact to. Um, I think it's an interesting choice. And I think it, it also kind of reflects the libertarian leanings of those founders at Palantir. I mean, if you know their backgrounds, you know, those, those guys have a very strong libertarian leaning. So they would, they would favor something like gold or crypto. Uh, but, you know, even if gold were to double from here, you know, it's not going to be that material to Palantir's overall value. So, um, I think like Nikki said, it's probably more of a diversifying away from fiat more than anything. Yeah. 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 I mean, that I would know, you know, a couple months ago, I was looking at my portfolio and I looked at the amount of dollars that I had and I'm like, this is way too much. You know, every, the dollar is getting devalued against everything that matters, right? What matters? Obviously land and real, like real estate, um, commodities, uh, income producing assets, crypto, right? Hard assets like Bitcoin, Um, so I was like, all right, well, let me kind of get out of this and diversify into other things that I'm not in enough. And one of those things was land. I'm like, let me buy some acreage where I think the values are going to sustain itself. So if I was a large company that was sitting on billions of dollars, like you got to think of the opportunity cost and the drawdowns you're going to have in purchasing power. If you just sit in dollars as we just continue to print more and more. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. All right. You guys want to do some Q and A? Oh, yeah. I mean, real quick, we were going to maybe talk about some interesting names that we're watching in the markets right now. Give people a few. Yeah, let's let's do that. Yeah, I know uh, you guys have been doing a lot of work recently and some research. Let's give some nuggets for our viewers and listeners. Who wants to go first? I'll let you take it. Okay, I'll take it. Uh, I'll take it because I actually just released my first Substack newsletter piece on Pinterest. And this is um, starting to become an interesting uh, name for me. I'm already long Pinterest. I've, I've been uh, an investor in Pinterest for a while now, but 
I've scaled out most of my position and really it's not a core position for me anymore. And I'm thinking about maybe, you know, be, this becoming a core position for me again. The reason is uh, Pinterest actually was down on their latest earnings release and it's still selling off. And Snapchat is a, is a pretty good comparable for them. And Snapchat was actually up on their earnings release and um, has been holding pretty well. So their the valuations between Snapchat and Pinterest are basically completely diverging from one another. They used to move in lockstep with each other. And now the market is starting to not dislike Pinterest because they're trying to transition from being a static picture platform to a video platform. They're trying to compete with the likes of TikTok and Instagram um, who have really, uh, you know, dove into video. And the market is upset because they're going to have to replace a lot of that profitable ad space on home feeds with video content to try to engage people. And so the market's mad at Pinterest. And I'm thinking that if this sells off more, there could be an opportunity here to, um, to, to buy this. So you can read my sub stack and kind of, I outline all of my thoughts and, and, and what I'm thinking uh, across all different parts of the business and yeah, give it a read and see what you think. Yeah. I thought it was a good piece. I really liked how you showed um, kind of the difference between what's going on with Insta Instagram shopping versus what Pinterest is trying to do. And I thought uh, Pinterest's execution uh, actually looks uh, better right now. And, um, and then the potential to add video content, if they can do it right and do it well, I think um, could be super additive to their platform. Um, their earnings results looked a little bit weak with, I think, forward guidance, like you, like you mentioned, though. Um, definitely some things that investors got concerned about. And so uh, there could be like a couple quarters here where they're in a transition and the mm -hmm. numbers aren't going to look that great uh, until they start to get traction in some of the new like product initiatives. Um, exactly. But yeah, I like how you laid out um, kind of that future opportunity with, um, you know, the bets that they're making on the commerce side of the business. Yeah, I just think it's one to watch. They're, they, you know, they're trying to make make the business over essentially, and and I think that that's interesting. Love to be able to pick this up, like you know, twenty to thirty percent lower, huh? I mean, it could if the market gives in a little bit, then this could go with it easily. Yeah, I mean, people, I, I can definitely see it retesting that thirty five resistance level too. From like a technical perspective, it's honestly broken down some pretty key levels or through some key levels. So yeah, I think it's one to watch. Yeah. So uh, just to recap, you guys were buying this back last spring, right? 2020. Yeah. In the, uh, what the $20 range. Yeah. I was scaling into it down there. I scaled in before a little bit before the pandemic hit. And then when the sell-off happened, the 2020 sell-off, that's when I added to it. And I've been scaling out of it, you know, cause the valuation was definitely not, inexpensive. It was, it was a bit rich, but you know, they really benefited from the pandemic and had a lot of engagement and were able to really generate some great revenue and, and profit. And now, um, you know, I've been scaling out into the strength, but I'm thinking there could be a round trip trade opportunity here if it comes in enough and the business and management, you know, is still is executing and we're seeing results from these changes. So are you going to use kind of a combination of TA, like looking at the chart, looking at prior areas combined with some of the fundamental metrics or how, how are you thinking about timing this? Exactly. I would basically right now, my eye is on the TA a hundred percent. I kind of already know where it's at fundamentally. I'd like to get it cheaper on the, on the fundamental side. So if this comes in more on the technical side, I'm, I'm going to, probably become very interested. Um, but with that said, you know, it's, it's going to be a rocky few quarters for Pinterest as they make this transition. And so it could end up being a volatile, you know, battleground um, for the next few foreseeable quarters. Cool. We'll keep our eye on it. Uh, Trav, you have anything you want to talk about? Yeah. So I'll give you I'll give you two brief ones. So um, one that we one that we made a good fundamental call on recently was Wish, um, and and the reason I bring this up is not to you know just toot our own horn, but basically this is kind of 
I mean, the, the, the reason why we do fundamental research is because of what happened with Wish. And we were able to get out of Wish. Um, I had had a position at one point, actually prior to it becoming a meme stock, and um, ended up selling the position before this most, earn, most recent earnings release, um, which saved us you know, from a 30, 35% drawdown. So um, the opportunity for Wish is really interesting long-term. It's got an opportunity to kind of become like the global online dollar store. Um, there are dollar store companies in the U.S. that do brick and mortar stores and they sell you know, cheap items and they sell enough of it that they have like 25 to $55 billion market caps. Uh, if you look at like Dollar Tree or Dollar General. Wish has always been criticized as selling like crappy Chinese merchandise. It doesn't always arrive on your doorstep in time. Uh, they're certainly getting hit by like all the logistics stuff happening with congested ports right now. Um, but again, the long-term opportunity is interesting if they can become like the global online dollar store and they have a you know strong management team. Um, and, uh, you know, they think they can grow eventually, you know, for like many, many years into the future at like 20, 30%. But in the short run, one thing I noticed, I was looking through the fundamental data. I've been tracking their rankings in the app store. One of the things that Wish is really good at is ranking in the top five or six of shopping apps in the app store. And they've been able to do that for like the last five years. But recently, as of a couple, like probably one to two months ago or so, you can see this is uh, data from App Annie, Wish's app store rankings were falling off a cliff. So that told me that something's happening. Wish is pulling back from its customer acquisition and its relative app store rankings, um, either voluntarily or involuntarily or both. And uh, so that was a red flag to me that Wish's guidance, quarterly guidance in their next quarterly report was probably going to underwhelmed. It was probably going to be below expectations. Uh, so I alerted our community and was like, listen, uh, I'm out of the position before earnings. I think there's heightened risk here. And, um, you know, I think they're hitting, getting hit by the shipping problems, but also like things like the changes to Apple's privacy stuff, which is hitting their ability to acquire customers. So turns out, you know, they delivered a quarter that was way below expectations and their guidance suggested that just in the last month, their business has fallen off about 40 to 50%. So, um, they're going to, they're going to have to retrench. And obviously I think the long-term opportunity is still there, but this was one where we absolutely nailed the fundamental call before the earnings release. They released earnings stock was down 30 plus percent. Um, and we, you know, saved some people some money. Okay. Help me understand something. <laughs> so every time I see wish, which is usually like on Reddit or somewhere, you know, uh, somebody's tweeting a meme about Wish, like, you know, kind of like, um, what is it? Expectation versus reality, right? Like, here's the picture of this beautiful dress. And then like a girl gets the dress, puts it on and takes a picture of what it actually looks like. Help me understand who the hell is actually buying products on Wish. And like, what is the bull case there? And like, you know, because if it seems like to me, you can only screw people over so many times before you burn up your reputation and like you burn up your customer base where people are like, okay, well, I'm obviously not going to order there again. Right. Like, it, is there anybody actually getting like a good experience on Wish or is it just like they're just going to continue that business model of basically lying, right? And like showing a product <laughs> and delivering something that's like 10% the quality no, your, your points are dead on. And, you know, I talked about the, the longer term opportunity for them is to become like a global online dollar store. And what I think they need to do is they need to move away from this like crappy Chinese knockoff merchandise and do more of what the, the actual brick and mortar dollar stores do, which is a lot of essentials, cheap shampoo, paper towels, uh, toys for birthday parties, balloons, you know, all those things that um, people actually need to use at certain times. Mm -hmm. And so I think they have moved into some of those categories. I think they really need to focus on those um, and less on the, the cheap random stuff from China. Cause I think you're right. That's, that's been a, um, you know, something that's not going to be sustainable. You know, you also mentioned there is a risk here that they've alienated too many of their customers already. And that mm -hmm. that becomes a headwind for them in the future. And I think that's right. So I'm not in the stock. I don't think it, I don't, think it's going to make sense to be in the stock in the near future, but I'm going to keep it on my watch list. And I think at some point there will be an entry potentially to where if they actually do start improving some of the core customer experience and the valuations down, you know, still down uh, significantly, then I think that's where you could get the turnaround opportunity and the mismatch because 
you're showing the perfect chart right there, which is the dollar general, 50 plus billion dollar market cap has been a phenomenal stock. Um, and they don't do online very well. So if Wish can become the online version of Dollar General, uh, then I think I think it could be compelling. Wish also focuses on a customer base that a lot of us probably uh, personally aren't as familiar with, which is they serve a lot of lower income customers, particularly in non-US countries. So there's a, a much lower household income customer that they're trying to serve, which I think is really an underserved customer. So um, again, long-term opportunities there, but I think this is one to keep on the watch list and just and just see how they progress over the next few quarters. It's not going to be a quick turnaround, I don't think. Interesting. Yeah, it, it makes sense that like, I, I see what the bull case is, right? Like if, if they can do what Dollar General did, which Dollar General is is absolutely crushing it. Like they found a niche, right? Which here in the US, for anybody that's not familiar, Dollar General will, will go into smaller towns that are, I guess, too small. And Trav, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, they'll go into towns where it's too small for a Walmart or a Target, right? And they can put in these small buildings in these little pockets and absolutely just dominate that area, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's right. And so if... Like, I guess what, so you're looking at Wish as potentially being like the digital version of that? That's right. Yeah. The digital version of that, that could even be broader in terms of being in more countries and more locations without having mm. to, you know, slowly expand with physical locations. So being untethered to, you know, physical locations, I think could be an advantage for them. Wish, Wish is also really good or historically was really good at customer acquisition. Um, you know, famously, there's uh, one of the uh, top VC said that, the two best companies in the world at, at paid customer acquisition are booking.com and wish. And, and you could see in the app store rankings, that was absolutely true for wish over the last few years, even with a crappy customer experience, they were still among one of the top shopping apps in the app stores. So um, they, they have a lot of really smart people, a lot of technical people on the team, but they've got to get this customer experience right before I think they can build a huge, massive, you know, business. So, yeah, um, yeah, I thought that was an interesting one. And then I'll give you one more quick one that I think is also a stock that's down a lot, but that maybe could have a, a perhaps a faster turnaround. Yeah, let's is, hear it. <laughs> which is Nautilus uh, ticker symbol NLS. So you're all probably familiar with Peloton, connected fitness bikes. Um, Nautilus is a company that is a more traditional fitness bike and treadmill company. They own the Bowflex brand and the Schwinn brands. Uh, they do adjustable dumbbells and kettlebells. Um, but historically, you know, they would sell you the bike or the treadmill and that was it. Now they're pursuing the Peloton model where they have, you know, tablets essentially attached to the bike. There's going to be the ability to do live fitness classes, subscriptions. So it goes from a lower margin hardware seller to having hardware plus software and subscriptions. And so there's a massive opportunity. Management team here has a five-year target to increase revenue by 40 to 50% and be at, you know, significantly higher profit margins. And the stock's down so much that today the market cap sub 400 million, I think they could sell the Bowflex brand today with the existing business for more than the entire market cap. Um, this was, yeah, this was a huge COVID beneficiary. Uh, their last quarter that they reported, the last several quarters that they reported, they've been growing over hundred percent year over year. Now we do expect that to slow down, but they've been able to flip from a net debt position and they were on the brink of, you know, maybe going out of business a few years ago to now having net cash on the balance sheet, about 80 million in net cash on the balance sheet. And this opportunity to become more technologically advanced and start doing subscriptions for their bikes and treadmills. And I mean, the fact of the matter is they're not going to be anywhere near, near as good as Peloton at this, but if they can carve out a second or third place position in the industry and just capture a little bit of the connected fitness market, then uh, this stock could be, you know, double, triple, quadruple within probably two to three years. So um, that's one I've been early on. I've definitely taken some mark, uh, you know, some unrealized losses on this one so far, but uh, I think this one has a lot of potential in the years ahead. Yeah, this is the one with the Michael Phelps TV commercial, right? Is that the, the yeah. same brand? No, that's, that's talk space. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. But I must, but, have, been, I must have saw something different. Okay. What's in, what's interesting about the Bowflex bike is that it's actually got the ability, and I'm kind of mad about this because I have a Peloton and I wish I had the Bowflex bike now because it can move side to side, which is a feature that a lot of people have probably never even heard of. 
Um, but I've actually experienced this. Uh, it's called a real rider bike. And they, I, I thought that they had the patents for this and no one else could do this with, with a spin bike. Mm. Um, but if you click on Bowflex in the top left, you'll, you'll be able to get onto the actual Bowflex site and see it. But you can actually, yeah, you can unlock the bike and move side to side and it works your core more. And I'm telling you, it's only a matter of time before Peloton ends up releasing a bike with these features if they can from a yeah from a um you know patent side of things uh but i i love that i think that is so cool and underrated yeah I, it's funny i was on the the completely wrong site so okay so nautilus owns both the yes. nautilus brand bikes but the ones that are exciting are actually bowflex i see yeah yeah i think the bowflex uh piece of the business is definitely the the crown jewel, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but they've still got a long way to go in terms of improving the customer experience. I will say, like Nikki mentioned, they've got kind of a unique bike that leans, which I know we've done a fitness class with those leaning bikes and it's hard. It's like yeah. extra hard. It um, is. But they also have uh, they also have some other interesting things about their connected bikes. You could actually watch Netflix or Hulu while you're riding. Like if you don't feel like listening to the instructor while you're doing a bike ride, um, unlike Peloton, which doesn't yet offer this, you can actually watch, you know, a streaming service on your screen. Um, if you've got a subscription to the Bowflex bike. So, uh, there's some nice, nice features like that, that I think they can play up, uh, over the next few years. And, um, yeah, it's, it's could be tough going for them in the next quarter or two, given the tough comparisons to last year. Uh, but then again, who knows? We've got Delta hitting, so maybe we all go back yeah. to our homes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see if these, these stay-at-home stocks end up getting another, you know, spark of life in them. Yeah, yep. we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. Uh, any other stocks before we get into Q&A? Uh, we've blabbed on about stocks enough. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll hit Q&A. We all won't right, go cool. First question is from Kirill. Um, what do you guys think of quarterly earnings reports? Maybe in the 20th century, that was enough, but now we have enough technology that allows us to receive data from companies in real time. This system needs to be transparent. For example, Bitcoin is a, a great <laughs> example of such system. Well, Bitcoin is different. It's not like a company. I get what you're saying. Like the, the Bitcoin's blockchain is totally transparent and open um where companies obviously only report you know once every three months i and i'm kind of interested to hear you guys answer on this because i know there's an argument for some people that say hey quarterly is way too often we should go to six months or annually and then some other people are like well because of technology why don't we do it on a monthly basis or even quicker than that so what do you guys think God, no, please. No monthly. That's too much. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's too, uh, once a quarter is like, you know, there's just so much to keep up with, you know, that would, that'd be a lot. I feel, I don't know. Trav, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. Company management teams will definitely argue that uh, reporting on a monthly basis would be one too much of a distraction and too much work for their teams, which I, I pretty much agree with, but also that it, it would make them their company is ultra short-term focused and probably less long-term focused, which would probably be a net negative for a lot of companies. Um, we do luckily get a lot of real-time data on certain companies. Like we were just showing that wish data where you could see the app download rankings and things like that. So that's what a lot of fundamental based hedge funds do. Like when, you know, uh, and essentially what I still do, which is to try to go dig up data points between when the quarters are reported to try to find out if a company is trending up or down versus their expectations. So um, investors in, in stocks will try to get an edge with that type of information regardless. Whether or not companies should report, I, I, I doubt it would be a good thing if we had companies reporting monthly as much as I would love to have the data. Um, we see in Europe, there are co uh, companies that report like only every six months, and that's like not enough for sure. Uh, and that could create really large downward price moves. Like if you have a company that only reports financials once or twice a year, then they put up a negative result. Like you could see that a lot of stocks down like 40, 50% on earnings, mm -hmm. um, which wouldn't be great, but um, you know. So, there's, so there's, do you feel like quarterly is kind of a good sweet spot? I do. Yeah, I do. I do wish, however, what I would like to see is more companies 
being more transparent and also providing more operating metrics when they do report. What I think is BS is when companies report their quarterly results and they don't, for instance, include a cash flow statement in their earnings release, or they don't report operating metrics on a consistent basis. So there's games like that that a lot of companies play. Um, and you see companies like Netflix or others who have really good reporting and really good shareholder letters. And I think that's the direction on companies need to move, especially ones like these SPACs that keep missing their projections right off the bat. They got to win <laughs> investor trust back. Yeah. So maybe not more frequent, just better quality data and more consistent data and not just cherry picking what you want to tell people. I think so. Makes sense. Yeah. Because if you have too often of reporting, then that creates even more like short ter termism, right? For, for traders and investors, it's like, oh my God, the last two weeks of sales were down, dump the stock, right? Where it's like, really, that's just noise. It's not so much signal. Yeah, that's a good point. Cool. All right. Next question is from Ollie. Uh, have you been keeping an eye on XMR? So Monero, the network seems to be growing organically with transactions hitting 10% of Bitcoins last month. Any opinions on atomic swaps for Monero and Bitcoin with interest? Yeah, so uh, I, I'll just show you what I did with Monero over the past year. I didn't trade it perfectly. Actually, I turned it. This is a very rare situation for me where I turned a trade into a cold storage bag hold. Ooh, not Ripple, <laughs> Monero. Okay, so uh, basically what I did is I bought Monero back in January in the, I think it was the, hundred in between 100 and 160 through here in January, I bought. And then I was going to take profit on the way up, and I usually do. But what I realized is, I'm like, okay, with all of the the regulatory landscape around crypto and, you know, just everything we're seeing with the, you, you know, in the U.S. at least with the government really trying to get a stranglehold. I was like, privacy matters in this space, right? So I think that Monero is higher risk today, um, meaning risk of regulation and risk of delistings, right? If the government puts uh, pressure on exchanges or says, hey, Monero is illegal. We don't like it. We can't track it. And for anybody that doesn't know, Monero is one of the better privacy coins, right? Where Bitcoin transactions, Ethereum transactions, they're traceable. They are not great for privacy, right? For both law-abiding people and criminals, right? Like if you value privacy, Bitcoin and Ethereum by themselves, just the blockchains are not private, right? If you use mixers and some of the stuff that is you know the government's look at is kind of the gray area sure that helps but monero has privacy by default and there's a few others right so don't don't comment at me like oh why didn't you mention so and so um but so what i did though is i i traded that and instead of taking profit i'm like you know what i don't actually care what the price of monero does i just want this in cold storage and so that's what I did is I, I stuffed it away, right? So I have different capital buckets. I'll have my cold storage never touch unless the shit hits the fan and this becomes the only form of money or I need this money uh, where if banks fail and I still have this, right? It's kind of like an insurance policy. Uh, the other is like a multi-year kind of position trade where I get in and I ride the bigger cycles, um, which is kind of what this trade would have been. You know, again, if if we look at the chart, Monero from my entry, it went from, you know, the mid 100s up to about 500. So it had about a 200 to 250% gain, which it was testing the all time highs from 2017. And then obviously with everything else, it had a really deep pullback, right? So it fell about 65% or so. And then right now it's kind of mid range. So um, if it goes back up and breaks the all time high, maybe I'll take some profit if I feel like I want to, or I have another opportunity. But again, on a few select coins, I have cold storage that my goal is to never touch them, but more so to use them as an insurance policy. So again, I, I know this is kind of a long winded answer, but the, the idea is that yes, Monero is one of the coins that I think has a unique and interesting and useful real world use case, right? 
out of the thousands and thousands of cryptos that are out there, there's really only a handful that I'm like, hey, I want to own this as an insurance policy or own this as a long-term store of wealth. Um, and Monero is one of those. Um, for for better or worse, we'll see what happens. I, you know, I I don't have a huge allocation to it, but it is something that I say this is unique enough, and this has a real world. You know, it's it's being used in the real world enough that I think it makes sense for me to have an allocation to it. Makes sense. I saw there's going to be a Bitcoin update, Bitcoin network update uh, rolling out. I think in the fall at Taproot. And it's got mm -hmm. some privacy additions. Uh, I imagine it probably won't go the as far as Monero and some of the other privacy coins. But I wonder how that will that will compete. I don't know. I don't know anything about it, obviously. But I just saw some some headlines about it. I don't know if y'all have looked into it. Yeah, I mean, it, I I think it's one of the features that is many many years late for Bitcoin. Better <laughs> late than never, probably. And. I don't, I don't know. We'll see what it looks like when it actually rolls out, but I'm not holding my breath, but I, I do think that there's a lot of interesting and valuable development in Bitcoin, right? That's why it's obviously my largest allocation in crypto. Um, but as of right now, Monero has that as a use case. And, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, it's being used on the dark web today, uh, which Bitcoin was early day. And, you know, some people look at that as a bad thing. I look at it as kind of a neutral thing. It's a tool, right? It's not good or bad. It's just, it, it shows its usefulness. So. I have a question. Are people going for using Monero to basically like dodge taxes too? Because nobody seeing, does that. I'm seeing a lot of <laughs> comments. So yeah. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of comments like on my YouTube trying to like school me on like, Hey, you don't have to pay taxes. Just use Monero. And I'm like, eh, it doesn't really work that way. Like there's like legally, you know, there's a, a section on our 1040s that you're basically attesting to you use digital currency or you don't, or you use virtual, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And so well, well, look, the, the caveat here is that Crypto is global, right? And so yeah. not everybody has the same tax law. And so some people might live in a jurisdiction where there are no taxes on crypto. Yeah. In the US, if you buy and sell crypto and you don't report it, the government has come out and said it's a priority for them to go after you. So even if it's a privacy coin, even yeah. if it's not traceable. And that's what I just want people to realize. Like if yeah. they come for you, they they can find out. Basically, listen, they couldn't get Al Capone on murder charges, but they got him on tax evasion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, um, I'm not could... saying that's a good thing. I, I'm just saying, like, look, you know, if, if you're going to choose to live in the U.S. or the U.K. or Australia or anywhere where they really value taxing you, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pay your taxes or, or choose to leave. Right. Yeah. You, you don't have to stay there. You can expatriate. I just get concerned when people publicly say this stuff on in comments. I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah. You know, but it's wild. Yeah, I gonna, mean, look, I've talked to several people over the past. What year are we in? Like eight years that I've been in crypto that have gotten themselves into trouble with taxes. Either they didn't realize how big their tax bill was going to be, or they just said, screw it. I'm going to take the risk and not pay it. And then they got in trouble. Yeah. Right. So yeah. just, I mean, there's other, I don't know. Ta taxes are the biggest expense for a lot of people. Um, and I don't know, Nikki, you're the CFP. What, what do you want to say about it? No, I'll, I'll, the point I'm just trying to make is I just want to make people aware that just because it's not, traceable and it's, you know, or, or certain types of DeFi transactions, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can skirt taxes. I mean, even if you're getting paid under the table with cash, if they find out, they'll get you, you know what I yeah. mean? So I don't know. That's, that's all. And every, this every, is, oh, go every ahead. Monet, most large monetary transactions leave a trail of some type because you've either got to convert from fiat at some point, or, you know, like if you are in the Bitcoin network and then you exchange for Monero, there's going to be some trace of it. Right. And like you mentioned earlier, just, or just a minute ago, you know, if, especially if you're big enough, you know, you might be able to get, get away with it as a, as a small fish for a little bit, but especially once you get big enough and you start actually having real assets around and people notice and 
they look at your tax records and they don't, they don't add up, then you could be subject to an audit and things like that. And then, you know, the government starts to really come in and rifle through all of your bank accounts and your statements and things like that. And they will, in a lot of cases, figure it out. Exactly. (laughs) Or put the burden on you to prove, you know, that everything is legitimate, in which case, you know, you might be uh, in trouble. So you could probably get away with it in some cases, but is it a good idea? Um, Especially as you get larger, just don't feel like you're invincible. That's all. Just because yeah. it's not traceable doesn't mean. Look, there's definitely an arms race right now, but with, you know, like uh, Ollie, I think was the person's name that asked the question, said with, you know, atomic swaps or decentralized exchanges or, layer, you know, layer two type transactions, like there, there's a cat and mouse game right now where people are actively trying to avoid taxation and just do it legally. I, I don't know. That That's my non-financial. Yeah. Financial I mean, advice. look, the IRS still has a lot to tell us and guide us on when it comes to DeFi transactions. So we're waiting. You yeah. Know, we're waiting. Yeah. That, and that's that's the thing, too, is like there's still a lot of uh, just unclear. Yeah. It's, it's and, the yeah. new frontier, you know, and we'll it'll all get worked out and figured out yep. eventually. All right. Cool. Moving on, Manuel was asking thoughts on taking some 401k money out for an investment property. So again, we can't give personalized financial advice, but in general, Nikki, uh, any thoughts on somebody taking retirement capital out for real estate? And A, can you even do that? Mm -hmm. And B, if so, how? And (laughs) C, is it a good idea? Yeah. So you, you can do that. Um, if you, if you take money out of your 401k, um, you'll be charged with an early withdrawal penalty and you'll have to pay taxes on that money. So that's something that you need to consider. And then ob- obviously that money's out of the market now. So it's not going to be invested in the stock in stocks or whatever you're invested in. Um, the other thing to consider is if you decide to take out a loan against your 401k, that kind of has it has its risks as well. Because if if you separate from your job, if you quit your job or get fired from your job, there are usually clauses that if you separate, you're going to have to pay back that loan right away. And if your money's tied up in some investment or somewhere else, you're going to be caught with your pants down and you know possibly unable to pay that money back. So those are two things to consider is how much you're going to have to pay in taxes and penalties if you withdraw. And then if you take out a loan, you know, those potential risks, something you can do, though, that can help you avoid penalties and interest is you can roll over your 401k money that you're wanting to invest in real estate into a self-directed IRA. And what's cool about that is with rollovers, there's no there's no limits to how big how big that transaction can be. You can roll over $100,000 or whatever. Contributing to an IRA is different from rolling over into an IRA. So that's a key differentiator. Um, so you could do that. And with a self-directed IRA, you can actually invest in real estate and do real estate transactions. So you, you if you have a 401k, you can roll that into an IRA, self-directed IRA, mm-hmm. take that capital, put it into a piece of property and not have to pay a big penalty or taxes. Or yeah. Anything like that. Your money is still, if you roll it over into a self-directed IRA, it's still considered tax deferred. It's still, you know, as if it's in your 401k, it's the same, you know, um, it has the same characteristics essentially. Cool. So as long as your 401k is a traditional 401k and not a Roth 401k, then you got to make sure you roll over into the accord, the same type of account. So I actually did this or I did the second half of that where I took some money in a self-directed IRA. I took it and I did a rehab on a house. Yeah. It was a nightmare. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, that that's, I guess, the risk of doing this is like, you better know what you're doing in real estate. And I have really just taken an ass whipping in real estate over the past couple of decades. Every time I actually put my hands on a deal, it loses money. So I've decided I'm no longer going to do that. So hopefully uh, if you do decide to take your retirement funds and put it into real estate, you know what you're doing. 
uh, just be very careful about, I guess, what getting over leveraged, um, buying stuff like, you know, luxury condos that could have a lot of volatility in the price, buying rehab deals that could actually suck out a ton of liquidity, much more than you even have in your 401k potentially, right? Like think about the downside risk too, I guess would be a, a really good idea there. Chris, yeah. that's not true. You not not every real estate deal you touch turns to crap because you did a few wholesale deals. That's remember? True. Any okay, let me say it this way. Anytime I try to fix up a property, it loses money because dude, I can't manage subcontractors. I don't know how to go out there and be like, man, you did that beam wrong or you laid that <laughs> tile incorrectly or you screwed me on the price of this, right? Like, I feel like the people that actually make money in real estate are the ones that do it full time. Yeah. Just like a lot of active investors, the ones that do it as a hobby, they lose in the, the stock market or the crypto market, right? It's the same in real estate. So, but I think real estate's a hell of a lot harder than sitting in front of your computer and looking at financial markets. Yeah, it's harder in a different way. It's interesting when you look at the long-term returns of real estate and stocks, they're actually both pretty close to one another over like 50, 100 year timeframes. But a couple things that are different about real estate, like you said, like it's a very different style of investment. And also it's usually very leveraged. So most people's real estate investments, for instance, on their primary home is going to be like, somewhere between, you know, three and 10 times levered, depending on how much, you know, of a bank loan you're using. So you, you have to be aware, like a lot of people got absolutely crushed, you know, investing in the housing boom of 2006, 2007, and then the subsequent crash in 08, 09. So um, that leverage works both ways. You know, in the last decade, the housing market has been great. All these people have, you know, the rise of Airbnb, et cetera. Um, and so, the leverage plus the strong market has made real estate look awesome for a lot of people in the last 10 years. But we got to remember what happened in the previous cycle where the leverage plus the down cycle can really kill you in real estate. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you just be, got to be aware of what the risks are and the type of leverage you're using if you are going to go do real estate deals, especially in a hot market like this. I think another um, tip to add on to that, Trav, is when you're running the numbers to figure out if you should even be doing this deal or whatever, don't underestimate the costs of being in real estate, you know, the maintenance, all of the, the closing costs, uh, the house sitting and you not being able to run it out if you're trying to run it out or, you know, there's just, there's so much that goes into it. So making sure that your calculations are not, um, too general and really kind of get, get a little bit more granular with those real estate calculations to make sure that you're truly going to be able to make money on this property. Yeah. There, there's a lot of variables. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. And what's the saying? It's like, you know, double whatever you think the budget's going to be and triple however long you think it's going to take. That's what I they say. Yeah. Something like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm sure there are some very astute real estate investors that have done well and you know yeah we tell, know them there, there's guys and ladies it. out there that, that i absolutely crush it i'm just yeah not one of them <laughs> just, i'll stick to crypto <laughs> cool all right uh well let's see anything else you guys want to talk about before we wrap it up um, it. most of the good stuff today yep. yeah yeah i'm trying Unless to see if we missed there anything? anything yeah so keeping our eye on earnings um uh, not much to say about Bitcoin. I'll just pull this up since I didn't even really talk about the chart. Uh, I'm long Bitcoin, not heavy. I'm still waiting. Um, you know, we've had a nice bounce here over the past month, but uh, we're into major resistance. We talked about this at the last show, kind of the possibilities and the probabilities of what could happen here. Um, is it, we're just mid-range. And when you're mid-range, I don't overthink it. Uh, just sit back and wait for one of those inflection points where the odds tip severely in one direction or the other. And then I take a trade and, and do as much size as I can within my risk tolerance. So that's kind of where we're at there. Um, one thing, yeah, I'll just point out uh, or plug Nikki, your, uh, your new sub stack. I'll link this up in the show notes. What, what are you going to plan on posting here? 
I'm going to definitely do more pieces on individual stocks. And I'm also, you know, going to start doing some pieces around like portfolio construction, you know, just some education around that and some data that I pull. And um, I have some, some cool things in the works there. So yeah, I'm just, I'm just exploring my writing capabilities to see how I like it. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I've also got Stock Geek TV on Substack. Uh, it's been a while, I think, since you posted something, right? Yeah, yeah. I haven't posted oh, sure. since last year. I need to get back in the writing game. Um, I've been kind of focused elsewhere. And 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 frankly, um, the thing that I'm I'm pretty excited about in the near term is is doing some Twitch streams, uh, Twitch and YouTube streams. So um, I want to I want to play around with that. So if you want to follow Stock Geek TV on YouTube or Twitch, uh, I'll be doing some more streams. Uh, I'd love to be able to write more on my Substack as well, but TBD on that. <laughs> it's tough. It's it's tough to manage it all, man. I yep. I get it. I understand why. It's a lot of work. Doing investment research is its own <laughs> full time job, and then you know to add on content creation, it's a yeah, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. And then yeah. the community, which by the way, I'll plug that finally, and then we can wrap it up. Um, if you're not a part of our wealth building community, you can go to wetalkmoney.com forward slash community. Check it out. Um, we have a Discord channel. We do live classes every week. Um, we have some bonus courses in the members area on the mental side, on technical analysis, on trading strategies, on fundamental research. So just go check that out. And if you guys have any questions, you can always reach out to us on Twitter or email or here in the comments section on YouTube. Yes. Awesome. All right. Well, hey guys, thanks for joining me today. And yeah, we will we'll see, see you guys next, next time. Week. See you. Ciao. Take care, guys.